and a warm welcome. Welcome to Covestro Circular Economy Days. My name is Niko Polosuo, and I'll be hosting two talks this week around what's next in circular economy. Today we'll discuss the role of sustainable materials and technologies. And on Thursday we'll dive into circular design. So let's get right into today's topic. This summer we have had record-setting heat waves, hurricanes and forest fires, and the public is understandably concerned about climate change uh, more than ever. It's on the news every day, linear economy is becoming increasingly unsustainable, and we're approaching with our emissions the point of no return. The world really needs to switch to renewable uh, materials and fast, and start booking nature as an asset uh, and not as a sewer, of course. Starting this Sunday, the UN Climate Change Conference, also known as the COP26, is starting in Glasgow, Scotland, to follow up on the actions needed to maintain the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Today we are talking with industry experts about how to turn off the tap on fossil carbon and how to enable a circular economy specifically from the plastics point of view. A material sometimes demonized in terms of bans, but really a driver for sustainability when not wasted, but used right. So today we want to talk about carbon flows and renewable carbon and explore ways of keeping that carbon running in loops instead of warming the atmosphere. And let me just show you briefly the carbon clock from the Mercator Institute, which just shows that to reach the 1.5 centigrade uh, warming, we have seven years, eight months and 26 days uh, left. So certainly it seems that time is running out. So let's get our panelists in. We have live from the great state of Texas. Here we go. Nick Abatello from Dell Technologies, a pioneer in circular economy in the IT industry. Good morning, Nick, to Texas. Thanks. Good morning, Nico. Fantastic. We have a good line to Texas. And live from Cologne, Germany, Michael Karus, founder and CEO of Nova Institute, also a pioneer. Um, and his institute uh, is doing research and is promoting a fossil-free economy. Good evening, Michael. And let me get... Michael unmuted, and now we can hear you, Michael. Sorry for, okay. it was my fault, I unmuted you. Yeah, many thanks, and a warm welcome from my side. I'm looking forward to interesting discussions today. And last but not least, um, Johan Hart, VP for Mobility Marketing at Covestro, live from Leverkusen. Uh, he has exp expensive experience in development and, and market introduction of engineering plastics. And let's see. Yes. How are you, Johan? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nico. I'm fine. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, evening to everybody. And really looking forward to a great conversation today. Before we start, let me remind you that you can take part in this conversation by writing your comments or questions in the box below or next to the box. Also, you can take part in our Slido polls. The first poll is already up. The question is as follows. Does environmental impact influence your buying choices? So go to slido.com. I can show you the link here. Hashtag CE days, and then you can have your say. So Michael, let's start with you. Because I think that the biggest question right now is, has circular economy become fashionable? You know, I, I heard from you that there is even a company now that makes vodka out of carbon dioxide. So surely this must be a sign. And are these all are these signs that you're seeing telling you that climate neutrality is becoming mainstream? Yeah, it's it's the biggest topic in industry worldwide. Meanwhile, and uh, also from polit polit politicians and NGOs. And um, so the the reason behind is that we can easily see that 70, 80 percent of the 
climate problem is caused by extracting additional fossil carbon from the ground. This is the main cause of, of climate change. And so uh, also the material sector, we have to decouple our production from fossil resources. And you see here the climate uh, the climate mitigation star, which is showing our six-fold challenges in the world, what we have to do. On the left-hand side, you see what has to be done in the energy sector. We have to expand solar, wind, uh, and hydro energy strongly. This is happening worldwide. We see the 60% of the new investment in power plants going to solar and wind. So we are here on a good track. Uh, we need electric cars, so we need decarbonization of the energy sector. Um, we need kerosene from non-fossil sources for, for aviation. But when we look into materials, then uh, it's, it's a new mindset uh, needed. We need materials and plastic especially, they need carbon. So we cannot decarbonize them. But the question is which carbon we can choose. And it should not be fossil carbon from the ground, because this is adding additional CO2 to the atmosphere. But we can use uh, carbon from biomass, from CO2, and from recycling. So we can then do all the nice products we have today without getting additional extracted fossil carbon from the ground, so without adding additional CO2. And key, Nico, as we just said, the carbon in a cycle, in the biocycle, CO2 cycle, or recycling cycle. This is a message to the world, and we see a lot of companies being very active in this field. Thanks, thanks, Michael. And um, it's good to have Dell uh, with us. Uh, great to see you, Nick. Uh, because you know, Dell Technologies is a pioneer uh, in the circular economy. Actually, we have an audience question testing your history knowledge of Dell coming up. But Dell ha has has the idea of the of and the wish to elim eliminate really the concept of of waste. And Nick, I mean, you have ambitious goals of uh, having more than half of your product content made from recycled or re to renewable uh, material. So, can you talk a little bit about your approach to to circular product design? Sure, Nico. Yeah. So we um, in 2019 we updated and and made new goals for 2030, right? Which you know, you're mentioning around using 50 percent. Um, of our products will be made from renewable and recycled content. Uh, but we also have goals around product take back. Um, and you notice there that, it, you know, we, we're committing to take back one product for every uh, product customer buys. So these two things are, I think, you know, connected. I think that shows that we have to really consider, uh, you know, how we design products, right? And then also, how can we work into recover those products to reuse those materials over and over again? And you know, as an OEM, uh, we have an opportunity to create demand, right? We can create demand for recycled material, uh, which is needed, right, to develop supply chains or, or renewable material, which is needed to develop those supply chains. But then we have the opportunity to help figure out where those materials are going to come from as well by taking back our products, right? And especially in plastics, uh, in, in the area of plastics, if we want to increase the amount of recycled plastics that we're using, we have to get them from somewhere. Right, and our own our own products are a great place to uh, harvest them from. So uh, the consumers obviously have to play along in the cycle in order to recover the materials which are currently going out to the consumers and coming back. So this would be, I think, interesting um, aspect. What is the role of consumers from your point of view, Nick? And 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 are they doing enough? Can they do more? Yeah, what absolutely. Everybody can do more, right? How, how many pieces of electronic <laughs> do you have in your closet? Too right? many. Ask, yeah, everyone has a, a, a computer. Um, so, you know, us, we have a lot of focus in that area as well. We, we need to make it easier for them to return, right? We have to be able to, like, look at the cell phone industry has done a great job, at least here in the U.S., where, you know, you can return your cell phone and they'll give you, you know, X amount of dollars for that. But we also have to make it um, safe, right? So we have to be able to, you know, eliminate any concerns around data. Right, and what's on your hard drive, and then that you know, making sure that information is gone, right? And it's not um, how do we protect people's uh, privacy and information? So, I think those are some big challenges, and then figuring out like how, how do we segregate products, right? Because ultimately, we want to try to reuse as many products as we can before recycling them. So, it's like, how many, how do you segregate and how do you design differently, right, for different, different products? Like, which products do you want to refurbish and reuse over and over again? 
which products will be recycled, you know, as a first pass, right? How do you harvest components and harvest things that are still usable from those, uh, especially items that have a high carbon uh, footprint? <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Nick. And and um, before I go to Jochen, I, I really want to show already a comment we have from the audience, uh, which I think is is interesting uh, uh, I, idea. Um, what learnings could we take from economic incentives um, of electronic recycling to apply for for polymers? Because in in the in, in, I mean, before you know, in the mid to early two thousands, you had to pay if you wanted to get your product uh, recycled. Then it was free. But are we maybe going to a situation where you get paid to recycle? I think that's also maybe a part part of the question. Any comment? I I think that's where we're heading, right? And in, in that there'll be some incentives, like you like when you send your cell phone back, there's some incentive for you to return your cell phone because it has some value, right? It has some value, and it can be either refurbished or recycled. It's just about figuring out, hey, what what value can you assign to those products, and then how do you make it easy, right? How how do you make it really really easy for somebody to return something? If it's not easy, I don't think people will do it. Right? Yeah, so behavior a really really important aspect. So Andrew, thank you very very much for your comment, and I can see there are even Finnish people on the line making comments, uh, which is fantastic. Thank you to all the Finns uh, joining. But before we go there, uh, Johan. Um, uh, I know that there has been a lot of gossip, um, you know, that you can do amazing things these days. Um, you can, I heard you can make automotive headlamps and other stuff out of waste cooking oils. So the neighborhood burger joint here is a, is a source for engineering plastics, which, you know, sounds impossible, but, but maybe you can educate us. Johan. Yes, uh, Nico, uh, you could uh, you could describe it that way. Um, let me give you another example. Um, on on my way to the to the Covestro uh, headquarters to the office in the morning, very nearby corporate kindergarten, and uh, when I pass this this kindergarten, um, uh, probably once uh, once or twice a week, um, there is uh, this this uh, refood truck. Uh, just one example, collecting kitchen residuals so so bio waste uh, for for example from from this kindergarten uh, uh, next next to our corporate headquarter and uh, this is an example what you see meanwhile at a lot of places uh, uh, big kitchens other places uh, so use cooking oils other things so bottom line this is bio waste um, which in 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 earlier times was basically just disposed or thrown away and, um, and and this bio waste uh, can can have a second life in terms of very exciting and challenging products. And uh, to give you one example, what can be done today already? Uh, give you an example of uh, our engineering plastics business at Covestro um, from our polycarbonate manufacturing site in Erding, Germany, um, where we are using based on such uh, examples of of biocircular feedstocks where we are using mass balance renewable raw materials derived from such bio waste sources and residuals, um, substituting fossil feedstocks as a drop in solution uh, into the um, into the production process. So I bottom line, pictures. maybe you can you know ex explain um, because we have some yeah. press footage of uh, of the latest. You want to go over this? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was okay. Then I will I will come to. I wanted to continue with the second part. Um, so in this short video, what what you can see here from our from our Erdingen production plant for polycarbonate here in Germany, um, the, the barge on the River Rhine um, approaching. Uh, so we are pumping the the biocircular feedstock into our piping system into the tank terminal at the production site, um, which is a direct substitute to previously fossil uh, raw materials. And uh, here we can, we have a we have a um, capture of the. Of the tank terminal, and uh, basically as a drop-in solution, this ISCC Plus certified biocircular uh, mass balanced uh, feedstock is now turned into the polymerization. Here we uh, we have a shot of the uh, polymerization part. Basically, the the raw polymer polycarbonate is coming basically out of the nozzles. Here, um, here we see the granulation process. Uh, you see this nice crystal clear, slightly um, whitish, brilliant material. Here, a view of our um, 
quality control lab, um, where of course the material is inspected. Finally, um, in, a, in a final uh, process, injection molded, and you see how crystal clear and brilliant this material is. View of, uh, of the silo farms, and of course, it's packed in 25 kilo bags, huge big bags, and uh, um, delivery sizes as big as, as big road tankers uh, for more economic supply, where we basically ship our polycarbonate uh, all over the world. And this is just one example of a pilot plant in Erding. Uh, and of course, we plan to do this and to introduce this globally um, across all our polycarbonate sites. But this is an initial um, first step uh, and to show what is possible today. So, and um, going, back, um, going back to the material, in combination with renewable electricity, what, what we will apply in our production plant, we can achieve a cradle in a cradle to gate calculation, a carbon neutral product identical uh, in terms of properties to the fossil based virgin products. So, and, and if you look into the, uh, into the difference, the normal carbon footprint of a polycarbonate, a raw polymer, would have 3.2 kilo of carbon footprint per kilo of material and the RE material, so the alternative, which is from technical properties absolutely identical, has in the best case cradle to get calculation zero. And I think that's quite an achievement and interesting use as a drop in solution, what we can do today. And um, just to underline a bit what you have seen in the video. So basically, this is such a glass from quality control from the lab. And this is normal um, polycarbonate optical quality. In this case, it's an automotive lens material. It's an example from automotive uh, where polycarbonate um, has, um, has wide usage, particularly across uh, lighting and optical application. And this is basically the completely identical material, just RE means carbon footprint zero. And to show you an example, what we all know and use every day, um, this is a typical automotive headlamp and the industry standard globally is basically that most or close to 100% of automotive headlamps are predominantly made, uh, not only the transparent parts, but also uh, many of the optical parts, the light guiding parts are made out of polycarbonate. And just imagine the weight of this component if this would be out of glass, apart from the shapes and the geometries, uh, which can be easily done in polycarbonate, but uh, would be quite difficult to achieve in glass. Certainly. I think I, I think it's really exciting and fascinating what we saw, uh, because in the last decades we was always sure we can only produce our plastics from fossil crude oil, and now we see we can produce the same quality of plastics from waste, bio waste, recycled plastic waste, but also from biomass or CO2. It's really a new world, uh, so we can continue to produce our fantastic products and decouple it from the fossil system. I think these are really good news today. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, Michael. And maybe Jochen, just to just to follow up, because it's great to see that it is already possible today to transform waste materials, cooking oils, and I think Nick, you're losing a, a lot of other uh, waste as well. Um, but Jochen, from your point of view, how do you see the demand from the industry as as you're delivering different industries? You mentioned automotive. Uh, but how is circular economy now driving demand from from your side? Yeah, that's a uh, that uh, that's a very good and interesting question. Of course, we uh, what we see is basically from all industry and all products, we see this this great demand and the need to become more circular and sustainable. With ultimately the the goal to sharply reduce the carbon footprint. I think that's what's what's all about. Uh, of course, uh, I mean we, and by me, I mean uh, all the industries together jointly globally in the value chain. We are really at the very beginning of a very long journey. And I think it will be a journey with lots of effort and a long way to go to really achieve that and uh, um, with, uh, with the right ambition uh, to, to go for that. And um, the journey, from my point of view, uh, starts, starts with the design and in the engineering phase already. That means in future we need to resign we, we need to design products in a way that they're not just optimized for very efficient manufacturing process, but also for the for the disassembly and for the recycling process in terms of recycling of the component itself and also um, in terms of the materials and, and the application of such materials. So overall, yes, we see a tremendous demand for such solutions, but uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us and uh, 
uh, the job can only be done and can be successful if we do this jointly. Thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Johan. Maybe, uh, Michael, let's, let's come back to you because you have been researching and looking ahead uh, all the way to 2050. Um, so from your, from your point of view, how, how will be plastics be impacted by the demands of the circular economy? We just heard Johan talk about how he's looking at the demand. How do you foresee plastics um, being produced uh, as we go towards 2050? Yeah, first, I think plastics uh, will be very important in the future, perhaps even more important than today, uh, because carbon is, uh, we have, carbon is an unlimited source on our planet, uh, in contrast to metals and minerals. Uh, so I think uh, it's very important to make uh, plastics more sustainable, because we need plastics in the future in even higher amounts than today. And uh, I think the future uh, plastics will mainly produced from recycling and waste. Uh, this will be the most important source. Um, and we can drive almost everything in cycle. But as you see in the picture, um, yeah, thank you. In the picture, um, it will be not possible to close the recycling um, cycle completely because we have some losses in production. You have losses in collection and losses in recycling. And uh, the losses in collection are today even much higher. Well, this picture that you're only losing 30% in the cycle is already a big challenge to, to realize and it needs a lot of uh, policy framework, industrial investment and behavior, the right behavior from the, uh, from the consumer to achieve this. But even if you are so far that you're only losing 30%, you have to feed in additional carbon. And as you see on the top uh, left, it's partly bio-based, so that means that um, the crops and trees collecting carbon via CO2 from the atmosphere to grow, and biomass is containing a lot of carbon. It's mainly made from carbon. And the other thing is you can also utilize CO2 directly with modern technologies, with uh, um, chemical catalyst or in, uh, biotechnology. So that means you can use uh, biomass and CO2 uh, to close the gap from recycling. And so finally, you have a cycle completely uh, independent from the fossil system. And uh, this can be realized till 2050. But again, we need a strong political framework, investment from industry and, and change in behavior. It will not come, it will not come automatically, the system. But it shows it's, it is possible, technology speaking, but it is, of course, a big change in the mindset of society, industry and policy. Maybe, Michael, you can also allude to the to the question that I think many have is uh, producing uh, bio-based materials uh, for food and then for industry. I, um, what, what is your opinion? Um, do they compete with each other? Yeah, the main question is not whether a crop is food or non-food. The main question is, is enough land available? And if you have in your country enough agricultural land that is not used today, then, of course, the question is, what is the most efficient crop to utilize this land and this often food crops are the most efficient crops and they have in addition also some protein rich byproducts so in many cases food crops could serve as a very good solution and they also deliver additional food security because if you have grown additional food crops like corn or wheat um, or sugar cane sugar beet you can in a in a crisis you can redirect this feedstock from industry to, to the food market. Uh, so if you have a close look, in many cases, food crops are a great choice if you have el enough land available. Um, what is very important to understand, we are not able to expand agriculture, agriculture area a lot in the world uh, because of biodiversity problems. Um, so a few years ago, you thought you have still a, a few hundred million hectare uh, for expansion of agricultural land. This is not the case, so the expansion will be only very limited uh, globally. On the other hand, we produce today a lot of biofuels from these areas and biofuels are not so much demanded in the future because of electric car and fuel cells, hydrogen. So I think um, we can use for the supply of the chemical and plastic industry uh, areas which are today used for biofuels without, without a total expansion of agricultural land. 
Yeah, it's, I, I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, last week we talked also about you know the role of biodiversity, uh, and and uh, I mean we all need to want to get fed, uh, and our grandchildren want to eat something uh, in in eight years from now. So we definitely have to balance the way uh, we use we use land. Thank you for the yep. great questions coming, Nick. Please. And if I could answer, add on to something Michael said, right? Um, you know, these aren't mutually exclusive approaches, right? So if you look at the chart, you, you know, a lot of times you can add bio content to recycle content, right? So it's not like you have to do one or the other. You know, in fact, we actually do that yeah. today in a, in a production, you know, we use some covestrian material, right? And we take, you know, recycle yeah. polycarbonate, we're adding bio-based uh, polycarbonate, we're adding recycled carbon fiber to that, right? And making a product that, that combines all of those things. So. It, it doesn't have to be like, I have to do this or do that, right? You can, you know, the great thing about some of these technologies is as, as they're drop-in replacement, right? So you can just, hey, replace your, you know, fossil-based polycarbonate with renewable-based polycarbonate in addition to the recycle polycarbonate or what material you're using today. And it really doesn't have to be mutually mm -hmm. exclusive, right? So, I mean, I think that's the really interesting thing about renewable technology is how you can supplement recycle uh, technology or recycle materials. And maybe Nick, you can actually um, uh, continue because I- yeah, maybe if I, to... if I... Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Johan. Sorry, uh, Nico, I, I, want, I just wanted what, what Nick said, uh, if, if he, I hope time allows. Um, I think that's exactly the point. I think we have to be very open towards technology development and innovation. And that means also regulation in all the in all the on the countries uh, and and different industries. I mean, we have several uh, things in place and under development. Uh, they need to reflect that so that we have a certain time horizon as an industry to really develop the right things. And we need in parallel, for example, in terms of engineering plastics, we need mechanical recycling. And it has to be complementary with chemical recycling. Yeah. So in in many cases, only both streams will come to a result. We will not be able to uh, fulfill all our targets in mechanical recycling only. And uh, we have to distinguish also between very simple, fast-moving consumer goods or packaging and rather complex goods. For example, a high-end laptop device or even an auto automobile with completely different life uh, life cycles and uh, completely different use. I mean, some products. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks uh, until they end up in in hopefully the trash collection system in the right versus a car maybe with a life in 15 or more years so we really need to take this into consideration and of course the most important thing is really to establish this open and closed loops a lot, um, not many have been established uh, up today and um, innovative separation and sorting processes to be able to handle then this material either mechanically chemical way uh, in order to come to the to the results we need and on top of that particularly from the point of the chemical industry what we need is huge amounts of renewable energy at competitive cost to really uh, decarbonize our production processes and the same applies basically to the whole value chain so that's extremely important um, point thanks 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 Johan and now let's take a look at what our audience says do are they willing to pay more for a sustainable product and as we nick I'll, I'll ask you next about dell's road to 2050 but certainly it looks like 78 percent of our great audience is impacted positively by the environmental impact and i i think the lower environmental impact um that that you have so thank you very much for your uh comment there and i will as I ask Nick the next question, I will put up the next Slido question because this is now testing your knowledge of the sustainability of the IT industry and specifically Dell. And the next Slido question is up. Let me put it up there. When did Dell start its first free e-waste recycling program? Please cast your votes and We'll test that, but be, let's Nick go to you um, and discuss um, how is Dell planning to reach uh, the 2050 goals. I mean, that's a, that's that's a long, long, long way um, to go. Yeah, if you're referring to our net zero 2050 goal, right? There's yeah. um, 
you know, we were approaching it from looking at all aspects, right? You have to look at the production of products. We have to look at our direct, you know, emissions. And then we're also looking at uh, the use phase, right? And uh, looking at where where we can go make an impact. And of course, you know, for, for us, we're, when you look at all three of those things, uh, the making of the product where you're, you know, you're kind of scope three category, you know, one um, emissions is a big component of our of our overall mission. So there's a lot of uh, focus there, like the circularity, circular economy and, and net zero and carbon footprint are directly connected, right? So they're they're not they're not mutually exclusive again, right? They kind of drive the same thing. So if you're driving for a circular economy and driving to reuse materials uh, over and over again and driving to use renewable material, you're going to be reducing your carbon footprint. So you're going to be reducing your, you know, contributing to your uh, your net zero uh, priorities or goals. So, I mean, they're, I, I don't know, sometimes you hear people talk about them and refer to them as different. They're, they're not, right? It's all the same, um, all the same thing. If you accomplish one, you can accomplish the other. And we are seeing already uh, the audience guessing right so far. So they have been watching uh, Dell and Dell's activities in this space, which I, I think is really interesting. I, I want to discuss with you guys the recycling topic even further, because I think that's going to be a major topic in reaching uh, the sustainability goals uh, and also the net zero goals. Um, let's take some of the questions uh, from the audience that we have received before we go there. Uh, check our chat box for that. We Nico, one interesting question uh, for, for me was, uh, why is the share of CO2-based polymers not much higher than recycling? And um, if you allow me, I would give a short comment Please. to that. Uh, it's a question also from, from energy. Um, to utilize CO2, uh, you need a lot of renewable energy. Um, only renewable energy, otherwise the life cycle assessment uh, shows not nice results. So you need solar and wind energy. And if you go to recycling, normally the energy input is much lower. So if you have the decision between um, using recycled material or CO2-based materials, the energy balance for recycling is in most cases better. So that is one reason why uh, the priority is to keep uh, the carbon or the material in a, in a cycle. Uh, but if this is not possible, then of course, this is a great option to add um, a carbon via biomass or CO2. Um, but if you say no recycling, only CO2, then you would really need a huge amount of renewable energy. And in the future, there will be a lot of competition because almost all sectors need renewable energy. So we have still, even if it's renewable energy, uh, we have uh, still to keep in mind what is the best use of the renewable energy because there will always be a little bit rare. And uh, so this is the reason why we put in our picture mainly recycling and then as an addition CO2 and biomass. Yeah, that's exactly our approach, right? You have to look at the, the carbon carbon footprint and then make decisions like what is really the best thing to do for the environment. Right? Yeah. Let's, and, and thank you for the questions coming in. Uh, also policy questions I think are coming up. We want to also cover that before we end. You know, what is the role of the regulators to make sure that the developments are going in the right direction? And maybe not what we're seeing right now. Today, of course, we see the, the national commitments to reduce emissions are actually going in the wrong direction and they should be going in the right direction. So I think this is something we'll be, we'll be looking at. But before we go there, um, let's talk a little bit about, about recycling because there is mechanical recycling, there is chemical recycling. Maybe, Jochen, you can elude a little bit about the, from your point of view, how do you look at the different recycling methods and why do we need different kinds of recycling and not only one kind of recycling? Yeah, as I um, as I mentioned before, um, we definitely need mechanical recycling plus chemical recycling. Various processes. Uh, we will definitely see uh, in evolution in, in sorting and sorting and separation processes. So probably with mechanical um, recycling, we will be able to reach more and higher technical specifications in future, most probably. But uh, just take the example of the automotive headlamp that I've shown you a few minutes ago. I mean, such highly optical pure material, as an example, um, will not be 
is not producible by, by means of mechanical recycling. This is uh, technically impossible. If you think about uh, safety standards, this is a safety item, it's about light, it's about uh, sensor integration, think about autonomous cars in future. So it's about LiDAR systems, which are, for example, integrated in the head similar parts. You need super clean material and by mechanical means, this is not possible. So we need chemical recycling processes or as a first step, what we are doing right now, biocircular feed or carbon footprint zero result. And in the long term, also when these parts are coming back from the market, uh, yeah, with op via open or closed loops to recycle this chemically in order to build up completely new virgin products um, with a uh, with a corresponding footprint on it. So therefore, we definitely need both processes because otherwise, mechanically alone, we would have lots of technical limitations and lots of products wouldn't be possible the way we are used to it today. Thanks, thanks, Johan. And maybe we can, uh, Nick, take a quick look at the different material innovation and recycling. What would you do to recycle uh, the products that go into into a Dell laptop? Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so we have a lot of different materials we have to deal with, right? And um, you know, from all, all types of plastics to different uh, metals and, and things like that. So. You know, we've had a long history of, um, you know, using recycled plastics and, and using other uh, other materials in our products. Uh, you know, and now we just have to scale a lot of these things, right? We've done recycled plastics in our desktops and monitors since, you know, 2014, and, and in notebooks as well. But we we're now we're in the process of scaling that up even larger, right? And where do we use more and more of these uh, materials? How do we start recovering, you know, more material because it's directly connected? Right. If I if I need to increase the amount, I need to recover more. Um, but we've also been thinking and looking at where can we use, you know, scrap from other industries. So we're not so focused on um, closed loop, for example. We will look at recycled materials, you know, from other industries that we can, you know, take and put into our products. Um, I think there's a couple of examples like recycled carbon fiber, where we've taken, you know, scrap from the aerospace industry and the automotive industry and such, and put it into our notebook. So the quality isn't necessarily good enough to go back into an airplane, but it's great for a computer, right? It works just, you know, fantastic. And that has a really big impact on our carbon footprint uh, of making those materials by using the recycled carbon. And then even in our some of our soft goods that, you know, backpacks and things, you know, we've taken waste from the automotive industry and taken waste from other industries to make a waterproof coating that we put on our uh, uh, backpacks. So. You know, it's, we're always looking for those opportunities uh, to find waste, you know, within our own, you know, closed loop, so to speak, but also looking for finding waste that other industries don't can't use or don't find useful in, in making their products anymore. Excellent examples of open loop and closed loop recycling as, as in the end, as you said earlier, um, there is no waste. It's just recycled products, even open loop or, or closed loop. Right. You um, think about a zero waste, right? It are really thinking about how do you create a zero yeah. waste environment, right? Whether it's coming from another industry, coming from your manufacturing process, coming from end of life, right? You really don't want to have any waste from anything, right? And, and that's it's a lofty goal, right? But it's it's uh, where we have to try to get to, right? I think it's a very important. Great. So uh, we have to really tackle these questions. Let's go into politics. Always a, a fun topic to discuss about. Let's take in the um, the question from uh, Sinan. Thank you, Sinan. Uh, do you think industries will be willing to pay the cost of low CO2 solutions without directives or regulations? Let me put it up there. Um, what is the role of the regulators um, in, in this context to get us get us forward. I would love to also hear, Michael, maybe your point of view, because you have been discussing this a lot. Yeah, to come to big volumes, and we need big volumes to tackle climate change, we need uh, policy regulations, for sure. We see today that companies like Dell and others um, starting the journey, they're doing it, and they could find solutions already today, which are uh, except for the consumer and also reducing the carbon footprint. Um, but these are at the moment mainly pioneer companies and uh, to bring all companies uh, on, on this strategy, uh, we need regulation. It could be a emission trading system that to pay for your CO2 emissions. It could be a tax on fossil carbon. It could be that you have quota systems for your polymers. 
in principle, it would be no problem to say that 20% of the polypropylene and polyethylene, for example, um, has to be 20%, 30%, 40% recycled or from CO2 and biomass. Uh, we have those regulations also in the energy sector, uh, where in the US or Europe there are um, incentives using biofuels. We could do similar things also for chemicals and, and polymers. Uh, so there is a long list of, uh, of options. And um, I think the time is right to, to look to uh, useful innovation, stimulating regulations in the chemical and plastic industry. The policymakers the last 30 years looked mainly to the energy market. And, uh, but we have also to understand with the, with the uh, ongoing decarbonization of energy sector, the emissions from chemicals and plastics get more and more visible and the share is relatively higher than today. So we have to find solutions here and it should not only based on pioneer companies, but the regulators should support this development with different incentives. And I have named a few, uh, but there is a long list of options for regulators can do. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nick and Jochen, who wants to go first? What is the role of regulators from your point of view? What are your ex expectations? And you can now, you know, talk directly to, to Sunday and, and Glasgow. You know, this is where 191 countries are coming <coughs> together to discuss these things. Any, any opinions on that? Uh, Nico, um, I, I, I have an opinion. I have opinion on that. Um, regulation uh, comes uh, comes comes in many dimensions. I mean, a good example is uh, I mean, uh, take a European example. Regulation on the use phase of of uh, of basically emission of cars. The fleet emission regulation, uh, 95 grams uh, on the fleet. You could see how the industry started moving in a with rapid speed in order to avoid high penalties. So, uh, so this is a case which shows if it's uniformly applied uh, across a larger um, economic area, uh, it can work, of course, and it can boost uh, technological process and innovation. Now, for example, if you look at the footprint of the production build phase of a car, it's tremendous. Um, yes, you have certain carbon pricing on certain manufacturing process and not have really an equivalent carbon price on, a, on the finished product or the same you could apply for a laptop and say, well, the laptop has total carbon footprint X and the price for that would be Y. And this uh, right now is not really in place. And uh, so um, we, are in a, we are in a global competition. We are in a global uh, economy. Of course, it's very, very difficult if you do not do that collaboratively, globally, with global agreements. Uh, otherwise, of course, we will get distortions uh, um, yeah, and, and impact on, on competition. So it's very, very difficult. And I really hope that we can progress politically uh, jointly. Great. Thank you very much, Jochen and Nick. Also, the same question to you. What are your greetings? Um, I just, before we go there, let me just check how many Dell fans we have in the audience. Uh, half of them think 2006, half 2001. So definitely our audience uh, knows and understands that Dell has been a forerunner in the free recycling offer but any 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 uh, thoughts from you uh nick before we close regarding the role of uh, of the of the public regulations um i always kind of look at it as, as positives and negatives right for one it takes too long so it's like it takes a long time for regulation and, and people to to do that so it's like it's i think of the role of industry is we we need to be leading right and we need to be out in uh, in front of uh regulation so I think that's uh, that's what I'll add to the, what the other, the other pro folks have made. But I, I just think you know we got to, as you showed on your clock in the beginning, there's only seven years right left. So I think if we wait for regulation to occur, it's, it's going to be maybe too late. But I would I would like to add something to to Nick uh, because you talked before Nick about uh, we need new logistics uh, to close the cycle to have a better waste system to collect mm -hmm. all the materials. I think here regulators can really help. That yeah. cannot be done by one company. Uh, so to close really? the cycle and to make the waste going back in the cycle, their regulators can do a lot. Yeah, and, and recyclers are often thought as dirty businesses, right? Or they have a lot of regulation on recyclers. And if we want to increase recycling, then you have to make it easier for people to actually get permits and, and do their recycling, right? And you can't treat recycled material as waste. And 
we have to be able to transport it and use it again, right? If you can, if you can show it, right? You can't can't have you know countries closing their borders to waste if we're going to say we'll take it from one country to another to reuse it again in an app in something, right? That makes it really really difficult. Well, thank yeah. you so much, guys, for your comments and, and, and insights. It has been great to see also the value chain. I mean, we have we 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 saw you know we talked from waste and all the way to the finished product, whether it's a laptop or a car. But certainly we have seen many different aspects of how solutions, the circular economy, are already today a reality. So even though there is the dim doomsday clock, there is definitely reason, I think, for optimism because the industry is really doing a lot and is super advanced, actually, as we also saw today. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining from Texas. Thank you so much, Michael, from joining from Cologne. And thank you, Johan, from joining from Leverkusen and sharing your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, a pleasure for me. So, and, and of course, big, big thanks to our audience for, again, submitting your comments and questions and also voting on the Slido. Really appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the big discussion that I'm sure will also continue going forward. So, great having you all with us. And we will be back on Thursday, so in two days, on the topic of circular design. So be sure to tune in back then. And until then, I wish you stay healthy and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.